Hello and welcome to Motsum Festival 2021. It's great to be back in the Zoom sphere. My name is Lois and I am part of SWP branch Newham. Uh, this meeting is titled, Is Marxism Eurocentric Revolution in the Global South? Uh, I'm just going to outline how the meeting will run. Uh, speakers will speak for about 12 minutes each, and then we will take questions and contributions from anyone who wishes. To usher in as many contributions as possible, we will be keeping them to three minutes ma each maximum. If you run over, you will be mute muted, but you will be notified at two minutes once you have a minute left. The speakers will then come back for about five minutes each at the end, and which we will be calling on around at 1 p.m. The chat function is turned off today for security reasons, but if anyone has a question, they can send a message to the host to be read out. We have a, a panel of fantastic speakers for you. Um, our first speaker I'm going to introduce is Tala Ahmed, Senior Lecturer in South Asian History at University of Edinburgh. She's the author of Mon Mohandas Gandhi and Experiments in Civil Disobedience and is a member of the SWP in Edinburgh. Um, would you like to go, Tala? Okay, thank you, Lois, um, and hi, everyone. Um, yes, obviously, so the title of this meeting is on Is Marxism Eurocentric Revolution in the Global South? And I suppose the first thing to say is that um, there is a, such a dominance of a, this idea that Marxism is um, Western, that it's a European creed, um, and therefore it is completely Eurocentric, because whilst it might have some value in examining features of capitalism um, and perhaps economic power structures, predominantly in the West. Therefore, Marxism has very little to say about developments in the global South. After all, Karl Marx was a gray haired old man who just sat in the British Library reading obscure old books and documents um, on political economy, and that really he's just a dead white man and that there's very little that he can teach us about anything in the 21st century, particularly in the global South. Um, and this is such a dominant idea. Um, I mean, it, it's particularly in academia, but also in political movements. Um, and because I teach on South Asian history, I see this quite um, on a regular basis, particularly um, with both students and colleagues who, particularly in the uh, um, part of the world that I um, do my research on, on India, say that um, what Marx wrote about India, what he had to say about India, really illustrates um, that Marx really had no understanding and saw the global south as being backward. Um, and so therefore I'm going to use my 12 minutes, really 10, 12 minutes to really just go through India as an example um, to not just explain what Marx actually said about India, but also uh, by way of an illustration of what his method was in terms of trying to understand the world, um, because I don't really buy the idea that Marx is Eurocentric. Um, and Marx started writing um, on India in 1853. He wrote for the New York Tribune, uh, which is an American newspaper. It was a progressive newspaper, an anti-slavery newspaper. And Marx was his, um, the chief European correspondent from 1851 to 1862. Um, and he started writing about India um, in 1853. And when, it, and when you read the first few articles that he writes, it is quite interesting because he does talk about how in India, courtesy of the East India Company um, arriving there, that you do have um, infrastructure projects that are built, for example, railways, roads and what have you. And Marx also in his early writings does use the language of barbarism and civilization. So in the very first piece that he writes about India, um, on the 25th of June in 1853, uh, he calls it the British rule in India. And he says that before the British conquest, India's overall social structure remained unaltered since its remotest antiquity. Um, and in that really sort of like you have this notion that Marx's understanding of India was that somehow this was a place that time had forgotten, everything just stood still. Um, so for example, Marx also uses uh, phrases such as the Asiatic mode of production. He also uses the notion of oriental despotism when he's writing about India. Um, and that therefore people argue this goes to prove that Marx's sense that really progress comes from the West and that in India, it was only as a result of the East India Company going there that you begin to see development and you begin to see progress. 
Um, and uh, Marx finishes that first article by saying that Britain destroyed its traditional economy through the importation of steam and free trade. And this, they argue, Marx sees as being progressive. Um, and Marx ends that piece by saying that the British have thus produced the greatest and the only social revolution ever heard of in Asia. Now, obviously, at one level, if we were to stop there in terms of Marx's writings and in terms of what he had to say, then perhaps this is damning and it would be problematic indeed. But I think in a way, if you're going to look at what Marx wrote about India, you have to look at everything he wrote about India. And he wrote about India for the next, um, for the, for, for the next decade or so. And I think in some ways far more significant are Marx's later writings on India, particularly when he starts writing four years later in 1857. And what Marx is writing about here is the great rebellion, the great uprising and revolt that takes place beginning in May 1857, which is an incredible rebellion. The British called it a mutiny because it began with soldiers inside their own army, Indian soldiers who they held as being a very loyal uh, institution to the British. Um, and there was um, this, as the British called it, a mutiny, but a massive uprising um, that completely shook British complacency in India apart. It took the British the best part of a year to quell this rebellion. Um, but Marx writes from um, Europe, writing about this rebellion. And what does he have to say about it? Well, from the very beginning, Marx, in his first piece, um, on the 15th of July, 1857, he calls this piece the revolt in the Indian army. And he notes from the very beginning how the British had used the old adage of divide and rule and how this was utilized to create, as Marx wrote, the antagonism of various races, tribes, castes, creeds, and sovereignties. Obviously, Marx is using the language of the period there. And he goes on to say that they use this policy of divide and rule to maintain the vital principle of British supremacy throughout India. He then also goes on to point to the contradictions and tensions which began to fuel the first general resistance in India. Um, and he writes incredibly favorably about this. He says that it goes to show that the native army cannot be relied upon any further by the British. And this is shown in these various mutinies that are taking place. What's quite remarkable here is that Marx understood that the East India Company, although it may have brought infrastructure change and projects, nevertheless, this was a machinery that was completely ruthless. It was an extractive um, organization whose prime purpose was the gaining of profit, of power um, and of domination. And the way to achieve that was to oppress the vast majority of the Indians. Marx goes on to also talk about the theme of national unity. Uh, which was evolving during this mutiny. Um, so he talks about how in um, the city of Banaras, which is in North India, he says that there was an attempt to disarm a native regiment, native meaning Indian regiment, but this was resisted by Sikhs. And he writes, the Sikhs, like the Mohammedans, meaning the Muslims, were making common cause with the Brahmins, and Brahmins was the term he used for, for Hindus at the time. And he says, and thus the general union against British rule of all different tribes was rapidly progressing throughout the land. Um, now, even though Marx could understand that there was a level of disorganization amongst the rebels, nevertheless, he understood and he came to the conclusion that for British leaders, they considered the military mutiny was in truth a national revolt that was unfolding in India. And Marx was struck by the combativity of the mutineers that was completely relentless throughout that one year of their opposition to British rule. Throughout the whole, the pages of, um, of his articles- You've got five minutes in, left. It, thanks, in, in the Daily Tribune. Marx was also involved in one other activity and that was in defending the rebels unconditionally against charges of cruelty. Uh, because as you can imagine in the British press, at that time, there were all kinds of torrid stories that were appearing about the atrocities that were being committed by the Indian rebels. So, for example, there were all kinds of articles that were written purporting to be eyewitness accounts about how decent British women, girls, had been raped, mutilated, attacked, killed by these 
by these, you know, these hordes of, uh, of violent Indian men and what have you. Um, and Marx wouldn't have any of this at all. He said that, to be sure, OK, fair enough, there were atrocities that were committed. Um, but Marx understood that this really was, as he writes it, he says that they are only in reflex, uh, in concentrated form, the creation of England's own conduct in India and that these are the characteristics of war and in insurrection. And Marx defended ordinary Indians because he could understand that what they were doing was using, as Lenin would write about it much later, that this was the notion of self-defense is no offense. They were defending themselves and in defending themselves, they had to use violence because the greater violence that was being enacted in India at that time was by the British state itself in order to hold on to its prized possession of India. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because I think what's quite important to understand is the development in Marxist writings also demonstrates the development in Marxist thought and how Marx was using the method that he had been developing in the Communist Manifesto and in other writings in order to make sense of India. Now, Marx had never visited India. When he was writing in his earlier pieces and using the language of progress and barbarism and the Asiatic mode of production, etc., he was having to rely upon some very low level sources coming from British Orientalists, who of course mostly did not have any interest in wanting to defend ordinary Indians against the British. And so therefore perhaps Marx can be forgiven for some of those earlier phrases, but what is absolutely clear is that when Marx sees the revolt that is unfolding in India, he knows exactly which side he is on. And the reason for this is because he understands and completely that the world was divided between a minority of those who rule and govern us at the top of society, whose prime purpose is to live in the most incredible levels of luxury and to guard that luxury against the majority of us whose labor power and exploitation and oppression they rely upon to keep, that, to keep them in that luck of luxury. The British were going to use any force whatsoever in order to hold on to their power in India. And Marx understood that when the force arose in India that was opposing the British, he was implacably on the side of those rebels and remained so throughout that, uh, that rebellion. And what for me this illustrates is the capacity, not just of Marx's thinking, but much more fundamentally, the method that Marx is employing in terms of trying to understand not only what had happened in, in the West and in Britain in terms of capitalism, but also to make sense of events as they were unfurling in India. And therefore, this demonstrates to me that far from Marx's method being Eurocentric, far from Marx's ideas only being relevant to the Western world and to European societies, and far from writing about economic power structures which somehow only apply to the West, Marx could understand economics, politics, and also social structures as they applied in different parts of the world. And I think that if one is to read Marx's writings seriously well, and in left. totality in terms of um, India, it becomes very self-evident to me that Marx's method is far from being Eurocentric. It in fact is truly global and truly anti-racist. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tala. Um, our next speaker today is Tavadza Choto, an activist in Zimbabwe and member of the International Socialist Organization there. Right. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I'll continue from where Talet has left and uh, looking at uh, Africa. Uh, is Marxism Eurocentric? Uh, revolution in the global south. I'll start by highlighting that um, the radical African nationalists have been at the forefront of criticizing uh, Marxism and communism as Eurocentric or as a white thing, arguing that uh, the black Africans should not rely on it to uh, free themselves. Uh, they argued that uh, Marx developed the um, uh, ideas from a European perspective, ignoring the developments that uh, were taking uh, place in other societies. Some have even accused um, Marx of being uh, a racist. 
Um, I would want to say that it is true that uh, Marx and Engels uh, developed their ideas from looking at Europe uh, since capitalism. It started developing there in the late 16th century. But we see that by the 19th century, uh, capitalism is spread throughout the whole world, uh, including Africa, uh, where uh, the feudal system was uh, displaced by, was overthrown uh, by, the, by the capitalist system. We see the, the overthrow of the Zulu kingdom in uh, South Africa, uh, the Roji empire, the Ndebele state in, uh, in Zimbabwe, the Ausa kingdom of Kano in, uh, in Nigeria. And then afterwards, um, as was argued by Marx and Engels in the communist manifesto that uh, Marxism compels all nations on pain of extinction to adopt the bourgeoisie mode of production. It compels them to introduce what it calls civilization into their midst. It creates a world after its own image. Um, this was true for Africa under colonialism and it's true for Africa in the post-colonial period, the current neo-colonialism. Uh, neo Even those radical uh, African nationalism, uh, nationalists would not dare dream to go back to the feudal system, but uh, would actually push uh, uh, for the build of stronger African capitalist uh, states. Um, to help me analyze whether uh, Marxism is uh, Eurocentric or is it relevant to Africa? I'm going to look at about three key tenants that were uh, produced by Marx and Engels uh, when they were looking at uh, capitalism in, in Europe uh, to look at those to see if these tenants are relevant or are they applicable uh, in, uh, in Africa so that we see whether it's, uh, such, uh, Marxism is relevant in Africa. Um, the first one that I'll look at uh, is the one that was developed by Marx uh, that uh, the source of profits for the capitalist system is through their exploitation of, of the workers through the wage system. Uh, they developed that a worker does not own the means of production but relies on their labor that they sell it to the capitalists and in return uh, they get very low wages. Uh, with the surplus being taken by the, uh, by the owners of uh, means of production, who are their employers, the capitalist uh, class as, uh, as profits. Uh, we see that this is true for Africa during the colonization period and uh, afterwards. If we look today, uh, the GDP uh, for most of African countries is dominated by the wealth that is produced by the workers who are working in the agriculture, mining, service, tourism, and manufacturing sectors. Yet these are all paid very low wages, uh, pertinent uh, wages. Uh, today in Zimbabwe, the national minimum wage is 2,500 uh, Zimbabwean dollars. Yet the poverty data line says, for a worker to be able to survive, they need 28,000. Uh, yet the worker is producing a lot of uh, wealth but it's all being taken by the bosses. This is why in, uh, in Africa and also in Zimbabwe, we have yet seen uh, black billionaires rising up. Uh, the likes of Dangote, Patrick Motsope, uh, Isabel Dos Santos, as Fred Mansiwa in Zimbabwe, they are telling us that they rose up, they made their billion, bill, billions through their hard work but this is through the oppression of the, of the workers that they've been able to join the international billionaire, class of billionaires. Uh, the second uh, tenant that was raised by uh, Marx and Engels is that um, the economic crisis that is inherent in the capitalist uh, system uh, because of the un unplanned uh, production, which leads to overproduction of uh, goods and services that workers and peasants cannot afford to buy, cannot, uh, are not able to buy. And this leads to a uh, crisis within the capitalism system. And uh, once the, the system goes into that crisis, it seeks to recover through 
uh, brutal super exploitation of the workers, uh, the poor, uh, and also competition amongst the capitalists, uh, which is why we witness First and Second World War. We see that this is true uh, in, uh, in Africa today. I would want to look at, uh, at uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, when cracks were beginning to emerge within the capitalist system, we saw Africa being encouraged to adopt the economic, the structural adjustment programs. Uh, Zimbabwe adopted the economic structural adjust adjustment program in the 90s uh, with austerity measures uh, being imposed against the working class that led to massive poverty within the workers, students, and the poor. Uh, the opening up of the, of the economy also led to deindustrialization, not only of Zimbabwe, but uh, of most of the African countries. Uh, another element is that in uh, 2008-2009, the world witnessed a, the, the a great recession, and uh, one that was the worst after the 1930s. In, uh, in Zimbabwe, in November, Zimbabwe suffered the second highest annual hyperinflation in the modern history uh, of 89.7, trillion, second only to the Wena uh, Republic in, uh, in German. I would move on to say that um, Marx also argued that um, for the working class to be able to overcome the capitalist system, they have to be united. Uh, and I would want to highlight the example of Zimbabwe. Uh, when workers were responding to the austerity measures by ESAP in the late 90s, uh, we saw the unit of the working class that scared the ruling uh, ZANU-PF and also the, the capitalist system that then in, uh, hijacked the struggles seeking to neutralize them so that they do not de degenerate into massive uh, working class struggles that could influence others uh, on the continent. I want to conclude by um, saying that looking at those two, that I, the three that I've highlighted, the ideas that were developed by Marx and Engels uh, are relevant. Marxism is relevant in Africa today, uh, but uh, that is not to discount the valid points that have been raised by the radical uh, black and nationalist, radical African, African nationalist. Uh, this is because if we look at how capitalism developed, it developed through the slave trade, uh, the colonization of Africa. These were really brutal and they were deeply marked by racism uh, against blacks, against Africans. Uh, than any other grouping. This is why last year we witnessed the Black Lives Matter um, taking place in America and spreading throughout, uh, throughout the world. Uh, the arguments by the radical African nationalists or the Black Lives Matter, yes, they can bring some reforms, but these, no, these reforms are only temporary and uh, do not last. Uh, and that makes it Marxism relevant to Africa in that you need to remove the system that is the root cause of the, of the problem. If we look at um, most African countries gained their independence and after that most were involved in great political revolutions uh, against apartheid, against the structural adjustment programs, dictatorship all over the, the continent. Um, they were able to remove some of the hated dictators. In uh, 2017, in Zimbabwe, thousands of ordinary people marched in the streets of uh, Arare, demanding for Mugabe to go uh, and celebrated his, reg his resignation. But because the capitalist system remained in place, uh, Zimbabweans are worse off uh, today than they were in uh, 2017. So I want to end by saying that uh, as Karl Marx and Engels said, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. Uh, Marxism remains relevant. And more so the fact that Marxism is an evolving and developing ideology and it's not imprisoned in everything that 
Max and Angels uh, and Angels said. So the task is for us um, to build uh, revolutionary organizations. Uh, otherwise, if not, we can uh, suffer what happened in uh, Egypt, Tunisia, and Sudan that uh, were defeated and um, compromised. So I invite you to join us in the IST uh, Africa and build a revolutionary alternative. Thank you. Thank you, Tafadza. Um, just before we go on to our third and final speaker, um, if you would like to speak, please put your virtual hand up or you can send your questions to the host to be read out. Okay, our third and um, final speaker is Trevor Nganvani, um, who's an, an anti-apartheid activist in South Africa and a former councillor in Soweto, who was expelled from the ANC for opposing privatisation. He is professor at the University of uh, Johannesburg. And apologies if I pronounce your name wrong, Trevor. <laughs> your last name, sorry. Uh, not a problem. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's such an honor to be on this platform. I have great respect for the SWP that is hosting this event. And I wish all the comrades strength, determination, and tenacity going forward. And I have the advantage of speaking after two great comrades, so I don't have to dot every I and cross every T. So comrades, we are here to debate the question of is Marxism Eurocentric? Of course, we must debate, but uh, our ideas must find grounding in reality, in what goes on, as we like to say here in South Africa, what goes on on the ground. So I'm going to approach this question of whether Marxism is Eurocentric uh, by looking at what actually happened here. And I'll talk about a movement, the student movement of 2015 called Roads Must Fall. It was also known as Fees Must Fall. And it also incorporated outsourcing must fall when the students joined with the workers to fight against super exploitation by the university uh, bosses. So what I'm trying to say is that rather than uh, focus on the debate, maybe in the books, general articles, I'm talking about a debate which had consequences, even immediate consequences for a movement which was brew brewing, which was happening. So, um, uh, so at the heart of my talk, because I might run out of town, of time, uh, is a critique of what I will call a movement without a soul. That is a movement without working class solidarity. That is the solidarity of workers, of the producers. And then, uh, of course, this story uh, of uh, the centrality of the working class in the struggle against capitalism, or the centrality of producers in the struggle against all forms of exploitation. This story begins in Europe, if you like, with a German Jew called Karl Marx, who couldn't stay in Germany because of his red card writings. He ended up in England, where he wrote his famous tone, Das Kapital. Now, one thing Marx said was, the proletariat is the revolutionary subject. And then, of course, another thing he said was, you know, we shouldn't just talk, but, you know, our theory, uh, must be combined with action. So, of course, Marx was only a man. He was human. In his writing, sometimes he got carried away or got it wrong, uh, things like that. But one message is clear. That is, the working class is the leading class because it is the class of producers. It is a, stra it is a class whose daily strategy, you know, creates a vision, gives a push, for creating a different kind of society uh, for the emancipation of humanity. That is his position. Of course, some of us, like myself, we take it to heart and other comrades, others, uh, you, know, you know, argue with this. And in fact, there is a book um, which uh, was recently launched called uh, Marx The Handbook of Marxism and Post-Marxism which actually, you know, look at this issue and actually, you know, draws out the lines in this debate. So let me go back to the Rose Must Fall movement in South Africa. So the call was for the stage of Cecil John Rose to fall. 
Rhodes, the British arch imperialist who made millions from the gold and diamonds mined here. And in fact, this statue, his statue was on the lawns of the University of Cape Town. Uh, this is land he so-called donated, but of course land he had stolen from the indigenous people. So the movement, the struggle of the students, they demanded decolonization. Decolonization of what? They said of everything. Indeed, at the height of this movement, they were demanding everything must fall. Roads must fall, exploitation must fall, oppression must fall, domination must fall, you know, yeah. So at its progressive core, the driving ideological position of the movement was to go beyond, to transcend, to have a different world. Now, this call for going beyond is a very progressive necessity of struggle, but it is exactly where the need and task of going beyond that it becomes apparent that there will be demobilizing pressures, you know, and they become more acute. The problems start, the questions start. For example, going beyond what? Going beyond your immediate issue, going beyond the immediacy of your constituency, of your identity group, going beyond your immediate confrontation with power. These were the questions which the movement uh, threw up. But one thing good about this movement, at its core, there was negation. You know, it followed on some of the best movements of struggle before. For example, the anti-apartheid uh, uh, movement, the struggle for anti-privatization here in South Africa, globally, the struggle against imperialism, anti-capitalism. So all these struggles, you know, in their various ways, they all carried what I can call a totalizing vision, a vision of another world. So in the developing struggle was a rejection of oppression and exploitation and a vision of an alternative for the students' decolonization. Of what? Of everything, a totalizing vision. A vision which encapsulated the whole world. A vision which could not live side by side with the idea that Marxism, you know, uh, you know is Eurocentric or is only relevant for the problems in Europe. So in fact, many of these movements I've quoted, they came before the Rose Must Fall movement, they influenced it. And historically, and in reality, those movements, they borrowed from, and they were inspired by Karl Marx's ideas. So one can think, I think Comrade Tafazo mentioned, for example, the leader of the Pan-African move, Pan-Africanist movement in Africa, uh, sorry? Five minutes left. Thank you. Kwame Nkrumah, he was a Marxist. Next door to South Africa, there is Mozambique. The leader there was Samora Machel and Frelimo, a Marxist movement. Indeed, even Franz Fanon, who was quoted quite a lot by the students uh, during their struggle, he talked of stretching Marxism to fit the conditions in Algeria. Fanon didn't say, let's stretch Adam Smith or stretch liberalism. He too was inspired somewhat by Marx's ideas. So the question is, where did this idea that Marxism is Eurocentric come from in this movement? And even more importantly, what was its implications? What was the result? Now Engels said, Marxism is not a dogma. It is a guide to action. So this is in line with what Fanon was doing stretching Marxism as he understood it to fit local conditions. Lenin, Samir Amin, Angela Davis, there are so many other Marxist scholars and revolutionaries who stretched, uh, shaped, reshaped the basic Marxist concepts, uh, the better to address their local situations uh, and the problems which they faced and tried to define. Indeed, the Black Panthers, you know, for example, they swore by German Mao Zedong's little red book. Uh, 
you know, because they were searching, you know, for ideas uh, within the Marxist uh, canon. So, in other words, uh, what I want to say is that uh, sometimes here in South Africa, we feel that our situation is unique and specific, but in many other ways, it's, it's just like any other situation in the world. For example, there were the disappointments of the Arab Spring, you know, the disappointments of the Latin American socialist drive. Uh, you remember Chavez, you know, uh, there was the, you know, the European and the USA occupied movement. Indeed, maybe today uh, it includes the Black Lives Matter, you know, but it looks like those movements, they're just like ours here. You know, we had a great student movement that eventually came to nothing. Uh, not totally nothing, but it lost steam. So my argument is that it became a movement without a soul. And the question is, what happened? So when the question of going beyond what was asked, you know, the answers were not adequate. They were not, they did not match the challenge. So the necessary political development posed by the situation did not provide the answers. So, you know, it became a site of claims and denunciation and increasingly the movement was directed inward rather than away uh, to and against the enemy. So uh, one aspect, the students were very, very vocal and resolute in owning their own strategy, you know, yeah. But like all the best movements in history, they needed solidarity. But this ownership of their own strategy was turned into an aggressive, accession of the struggle's own self-sufficiency. Yeah. So we know that when a movement starts to face problems, has to tackle issues of power, the dilemmas of political choice going forward, solidarity is key. But at the, ex at the exact point when this solidarity was necessary, you know, it became less prevalent. So we had now these claims of particular identities. There were disagreements, not based on, you know, a political identity, but were you part of the, of the uh, movement? Did you experience the pain of us in the movement? White comrades were turned out of meetings. Uh, older people were turned away. You are not part of this movement. You never felt what we felt, uh, and so on and so forth. This, this is not to say there was not an abundance of courage, determination, and militancy, but there was a start, startling lack of sharing solidarity and a vision of dealing with the issues of power. So it is within that context that, you know, one can make sense of debates like uh, Marxism is Eurocentric because now the world was divided into the global north and the global south, and then the world was divided into black people and white people. And then the world was divided between those who are old and those who are, who are young. And then it was hard to reach out and get solidarity. So my argument is that the true solidarity, the best solidarity is that of the producers. So members of the working, of the middle class, students have to reach out, be part of and share in that solidarity, because though that solidarity is based on producers, people who have a real chance of building a new world. So what happens is that there will be solidarity, there will be a yearning for solidarity, but the solidarity without it being located, you know, with and connected, you know, to the vision of the working class, it becomes a limited, a, dimin a diminished, and a damaged solidarity, a solidarity which actually affirms individualism, which is the very enemy of working class collectivism. So to round out, uh, comrade, I would say that uh, questions of is Marxism uh, Eurocentric? You know, they're good in university halls, you know, we can talk about them, but on the ground, you know, there is one class, the working class, 
You go everywhere, there are producers. Someone must do the work. Indeed, if we go and have our occupation at home, someone is cleaning our clothes, you know, even the, you know, the cell phones we use, you know, we tweet, uh, those cell phones were created by the hands of workers. So the politics of Marxism cannot be said to be Eurocentric. Uh, I think that, in fact, uh, I could say uh, uh, as a last line, uh, what we need uh, is a vision which is international, you know, because workers are everywhere. And then go back to Marx's idea that the real subject is the working class. And then the middle class, you know, the students, you know, for them to take the struggle forward, they should see how do we support this class? How do we make it happen for this class which can actually and then within the class, we'll find the women, within the class, we'll find black people, within the class, we'll find all the oppressed groups. But one thing for sure, we need to create a, a power that can match the power of capitalism. Therefore, we have to unite, you know, internationally as the class of producers and the supporters uh, of the class of producers. Thank you.